there, Wind Power students, Dr. John Schrage here, and we're moving forward to start asking some of the questions that are in the next chapter of Landberg. Um, and he starts off with asking about why does the wind blow? And this turns out to be a surprisingly difficult question to answer because there's actually many kinds of answers. I mean, let's forget about the wind for a moment. Let's talk about cars. A good question that a kid could ask, a toddler could come up and say, why do cars go? Well, you could talk about, like, the physics of the car in the terms of, like, well, there's internal combustion, which causes the, the pistons to... Or you could talk about it in terms of, like, the economic reasons why cars go, like people use cars to go places, and you could talk about other aspects of cars. And so there's multiple answers to a simple question, like, why do cars go? And in the same way, that's kind of the case with atmospheric sciences, and why does the wind blow as well? Um, we're going to be coming to different kinds of answers right now, but in terms of kind of a a very systematic kind of way, fundamentally why are there winds, it turns out to be an extremely complicated subtopic within the discipline of atmospheric sciences, the subtopic called general circulation. And general circulation is actually really important and a fundamental thing that atmospheric science students need to understand, but it tends to be the kind of thing that like a graduate student in atmospheric sciences would learn, and it involves an incredible amount of math, and that's not really the direction we want to go with this. But now, as the course progresses, we're going to be taking a much more reductionist sort of way. You know, we're going to get more like the car question. We're going to be asking, like, you know, we're going to be, you know, talking about, like, the physics of the chambers of the cars. In this way, we're going to talk about, like, the forces that are at work that cause the winds to be accelerated in different directions and so on. Um, but we're not ready for that just yet. Let's just talk about this in kind of a more conceptual way. Fundamentally, why do winds blow? And, the, you know, versus why is the atmosphere not just steady or something like that? And the correct, very basic root cause of why the winds blow has to do with uneven heating of the Earth's surfaces. Whether you've taken ATS-113 or not, or other atmospheric science courses or environmental science courses or whatever, you know, obviously, from your life that not all places on the Earth are the same temperature. And the temperature of the surface has a lot to do with the temperature of the atmosphere touching the surface. And so the air in different parts of the world are different temperatures. Now, why that is takes a little bit of understanding about what's how the Earth is warming up. The primary source of heat, really almost the entire source of heat with regard to the atmosphere, is of course the sun. Now on this diagram, I've got the sun illuminating half of the Earth. Uh, here's some rays of sunlight coming in. And notice I drew them parallel. I mean, the sun is 93 million miles off to the, uh, the left side of the diagram here. Uh, you know, from that distance, the sun's rays are effectively parallel to each other. And so, uh, here are some rays of sunlight encountering, you know, approaching the orbit of the Earth. And in fact, I then extended them to actually encounter, to be incident upon, to use the right vocabulary word, the uh, surface of the Earth. And what I want you to notice is that some of these, sun, these rays of sunlight are hitting the equator, where we know the temperatures are going to be warm, and some of them are hitting more polar, you know, higher latitude locations where we know the temperatures are going to be colder. Now, I don't want you to get the idea that, like, somehow or other the rays of sunlight that are coming toward the pole are somehow colder or carry less energy or something like that. That's not the way it works at all. Every beam of sunlight that I drew here, you know, as long as it's taking up the same amount of space there, they're carrying the same amount of energy. But... Look how that, because they hit the encounter, well, because they are incident upon a curved planet surface, look at how the area that each of those beams of sunlight illuminates is very different. In the tropics, that beam of sunlight that's coming in and hitting roughly the equator only has to heat up that relatively small area where the beam of sunlight is incident upon the surface there. Whereas at the higher latitudes, look how I, I kind of had to stretch the shape out a little bit to show you that the same amount of energy is now covering a larger area. It can't increase the temperature as much because it has to do so over a larger area. Um, this is, you know, the root reason why, in general, the polar regions are colder than the tropical regions, which I've il illustrated here by making the planet more red toward the middle and more blue towards the pole here. And this uneven heating of the Earth's surface establishes what are called temperature gradients. I like this word gradient, and we're going to be seeing the word gradient several more times uh, over the course of this module. 
A gradient is how something changes over a distance, how some property changes at a given time over a distance. So like there is a north-south temperature gradient here because there is a different temperature to the south than there is to the north. Um, the atmosphere does not like that, nor do the oceans for that matter. It is the nature of physical systems that they do not like temperature gradients. It is why fluids get in motion in, like, for example, when you put a teapot onto the stove and you start heating it up, there will be a flow of water in the teapot as it tries to spread out, you know, there's hotter water down there near the bottom of the pan where it's touching the burner, and there's cooler water up near the top of the pan where it's far from the burner. There will be a current and, and flow and circulation established in the teapot trying to resolve that. All natural, fluid, mechanical type systems work to even out temperature gradients. They don't want temperature gradients. And so the atmosphere and the ocean will try to flow in ways that work to smooth out the temperature gradient that we see here, to get the heat away from the tropical regions toward the polar regions. Again, in like an atmospheric science graduate class, they would talk in great details mathematically about how this is done and why this is done and so on. But just to give you a flavor of what we're talking about here, I drew two weather systems on the map there. These are cyclones, again, depending on whether you've had ATS 113 or other classes in your life about, um, about meteorology, you would know that those areas of low pressure that I, that I've draw, I draw in there with those L's are the same things that you see on weather maps that are labeled with an L. They're areas of low pressure. Those are called cyclones. And cyclones are these large scale, they're about the size of a country, areas of low pressure. In the northern hemisphere, they rotate uh, counterclockwise. In the southern hemisphere, they rotate counterclockwise. They're just a part of day-to-day -day weather in the atmosphere. But look what they accomplish. On their east side, cyclones drag warm tropical air poleward. And on their west side, they drag cold polar air equatorward. In both ways, they are working to get rid of the temperature gradient on the Earth by transporting warm air towards places that are cold and transport cold air towards places that is warm. I'm going to give you a vocabulary word there. The right word for that is advection. Advection is when you transport stuff with the wind. In this case, this is transporting warm air and cold air. So there would be warm air advection on the east side of cyclones, and there's cold air advection on the west side of the cyclones, both of which are acting to try to reduce the temperature gradient on the planet. That is one way in which the planet can try to do that. But more generally, what's going on is the warm air near the tropics is trying to rise. Warm air rises. We'll, we'll deal with buoyancy and stuff like that later in the semester. But you broadly understand this idea that near the equator, the warm air is going to try to rise, which is hard to illustrate on a PowerPoint slide. But I kind of showed you on the limb of the globe there how warm air is rising at the equator. And notice how at the poles, I have cold air trying to sink. Fundamentally, that makes some measure of sense, right? That we should be trying to drive some kind of circulation where warm air is rising and cooler air is sinking. And in fact, from a very simplistic point of view, we can put some arrows in here and kind of make a little simple circulation where warm air rises at the equator, spreads out, sinks near the poles where it becomes cold, and then returns towards the equator at the surface of the Earth. And that should happen in both the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. Let me just show you some more professionally drawn things. Like here's another example of that sort of circulation. See how warm air is rising at the equator, sinking at the, spreading out, sinking at the poles, and returning towards the surface. I like this sort of much more three-dimensional looking one that I stole from an, an intro textbook. Um, this looks good. These are called Hadley cells or Hadley circulations. They're named after Sir George Hadley, who lived in like the 1600s. He was one of those old dead white guys of science who, you know, back in the old days, they didn't, you know, he didn't go anywhere. He didn't go out and take measurements. He just thought about things and then went to the Royal Society and told him what he thought about it. Anyway, he came up with this idea that this should be the way the atmosphere works. Fundamentally, the atmosphere should be having plumes of rising air at the equator, sinking air at the poles, and you get this circulation going. And that would be great if that was the point. I could understand how the atmosphere was working if it was such a simple little thing. In practice, though, the real general circulation of the atmosphere turns out to be a lot more complicated than what good old Sir George Hadley thought. Um, it turns out that there's a number of reasons for that. The rotation of the Earth, 
uh, sets up what's called the Coriolis force. We'll be learning about that later in this module. But there's a lot of forces at work that kind of mess with the simple idea of the Hadley circulation. In fact, a much better depiction of what the real general circulation of the Earth's atmosphere is uh, looks like this, which is a diagram stolen again from another intro textbook. But it is what's called the three-cell model, because instead of having one Hadley cell in the northern hemisphere and one in the southern hemisphere, it has three circulation cells going on in the northern hemisphere and three in the southern hemisphere. And I'm like, this, that's not the purpose of this class, to like pick this thing apart and actually memorize all the parts and things like that. But this three-cell model certainly does help us understand some of the things that you see going on in the atmosphere in your life or explaining things with regard to like energy and so on. For example, if you actually take a look at this three-cell model, just like the Hadley model had, you could see how there's rising motion near the equator. It makes good sense. There should be rising motions near the equator where the air is warm. Um, in a class like this, we're not going to get into the physics of why, but rising motion is associated with thunderstorms and precipitation and so on. And you get that belt of thunderstorms and rain and so on that happens all the way around the world near the equator. This explains why the tropics are so wet. Okay, this is going to be about monsoons and El Nino and things like that. Uh, similarly, notice how if you actually kind of pick apart the circulation a little bit, you can see how there's a band at about 30 degrees north and also at 30 degrees south, although it's covered up on this diagram here, where there's sinking motion more or less all the way around the world at 30 north and 30 south. Sinking motion is associated with dry conditions, again, for reasons that are outside the scope of this particular class. And so that band of sinking motion and dry conditions explains why all the world's great deserts occur at 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. Uh, the Sahara, Saudi, uh, the Arabian Desert, uh, the Gobi Desert, uh, the, the Sonoran Deserts in Mexico, uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, the Atacama Desert, the Kalahari Desert, the Outback. All the world's great deserts happen around 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. Now we under, kind of understand why. Um, from a wind power perspective, I want you to notice that all the way around the world in the tropical regions and subtropics and so on, see how the winds are at the surface are from the east, maybe northeast, maybe southeast. Uh, by the way, notice how we describe winds. We always describe them in the direction they're coming from. So these are, see how the winds are at the surface there are from the east or southeast or northeast. These are extremely persistent winds. They're very different from the winds that we see in our parts of the world where the wind is more variable as different kinds of storm systems come through. And these are called the trade winds. Uh, we will, I'll tell you that story right now, actually. The word trade wind is often misattributed. Um, people think that the word trade wind has to do with, like, tall ships and then sailing and bringing, you know, trading, riding these winds from the old world to the new world to trade spices or something like that. And that's a lovely story, and it's a good way to remember how they work, and it's absolutely wrong. The word trade wind actually comes from the same Latin stem uh, that we get the word tradition. And it has to do with persistence. Uh, something that continues over a long period of time. And I'm going to be showing you some animations in a little bit to show you how, just how persistent the trade winds are. But it's astonishing. They're not like the winds in Omaha at all. Um, some years ago, I actually spent some time in uh, Senegal, which is in West Africa. And, yeah, I mean, I knew at an intellectual level that the trade winds were persistent and so on. Oh, I had never seen anything like this. The winds just blew from the northeast every day for as long as I was there. I, I, they, they just never changed. Day, night, it, it just was always the wind out of the northeast. All right, just to give you another sense of what kind of things are going on here, I actually highlighted there in black on that globe a feature I want you to see. If you actually kind of take a close look at that globe there, you can see that along that black line there is roughly where warm air from the south tends to be meeting cold air from the north. That's a feature in meteorology called the polar front. You've probably never heard of the polar front before because we tend polar front is a kind of a catch-all term for things like cold fronts and warm fronts and stationary fronts, terms you probably have heard before. And look where the feature is happening. That meeting of warm air from the north, south with cold air from the north um, pretty much happens in our part of the world, in the Midwest and so on. And that's because we do see a lot of passages of cold fronts and warm fronts and so on, stationary fronts and so on in our part of the world. If you, again, if you examine the globe uh, fairly closely, both at the northern hem uh, North Pole, which you can see easily in the South Pole, which is covered up here, uh, you have sinking motion, which was what Hadley thought should be happening. Well, again, for reasons outside the clouds, uh, sinking motion is associated with dry weather. And in fact, that's why both the North Pole and the South Pole are incredibly dry. Both of those places get almost no precipitation per year. 
Now, I know, like, when you picture the South Pole and the North Pole, you see all this snow and stuff like that, but keep in mind it doesn't melt, okay? The tiny bit of precipitation they do get accumulates over the course of, you know, hundreds of thousands of years, okay? They both get virtually no precipitation whatsoever. Man, this depiction, this three-cell model that we have here is a complicated business with all kinds of things going on, and, um... Sadly, it's still a simplification. It's still just an idea about how the atmosphere could be working. The real atmosphere is even more complicated than this because this doesn't really give you a very good sense of all the transitory or migratory, to use the right word, features of the atmosphere, features that are passing through at any given time. This is sort of showing you the overall structure of the atmosphere, but it's not really showing you how features migrate through. And just to give you a sense of that, I'm going to show you two different set, uh, animations that I stole off of YouTube. This is a, an animation of the clouds in uh, 1994, I believe, here. Um, they sort of stitched together satellite images from all over the world to kind of put together a, uh, a, an animation of how the clouds are moving. And I don't really see the general circulation that we've been talking about very well here because I'm kind of distracted by all these things that are moving, mostly from west to east. We see these sort of bands of clouds and swirls of clouds and so on. Those are mostly cyclones, by the way. They are migratory. They are accomplishing some of this business of what the atmosphere is doing, namely trying to um, reduce temperature gradients and so on. But man, things are just happening all over the place. There's all these migratory features passing through, creating weather, changing the winds and so on at any given time. You're going to have to kind of take the average over a period of time before you're going to be able to see features uh, of the general circulation. But I like this next one even better. Again, another animation. Now, these are depictions of the wind. Um, each panel or whatever that's animating by here is a day of wind data. Uh, so, I mean, we're seeing like a whole year of data or something like that here. And the wind vectors are showing you the direction of the wind and the coloring is showing you the speed. And what I want you to notice is just how persistent winds really are. I mean, to, watch with your eye the arrows like in the tropics. They hardly move at all. Um, mostly they're from the east or northeast, depending on how the video syncs up. You might notice that in the Indian Ocean, they're from the southwest. There's a monsoon going on in this video, uh, because that's the time of year they're using. Um, but even in places where there's a lot of, you know, changes to the wind, it kind of goes back to westerlies pretty quick. I mean, the, the winds are actually surprisingly like the general circulation. They are actually, you know, the migratory patterns are just sort of slightly changing the overall pattern any given day. It's actually quite interesting how the atmosphere, you could see both the migratory features and the persistent, or to use the correct term from general circulation, the standing features of the atmosphere, or the mean features of the atmosphere, like trade winds and so on. You can see them both in this animation. So, if I were just trying to say, fundamentally, someone asks you about the wind, you're working someday at a wind power plant, and they say, why does the wind blow? Fundamentally, it's about how a moving fluid, in this case the atmosphere, is trying to redistribute heat around the planet, trying to transport heat from where there's too much of it, namely in the tropics, to where there's not enough of it, namely in the poles. But how it turns out to actually do that on any given day, why the wind is doing what it's doing, we're going to get down to a more mechanical reason here. We're going to start talking about things like forces. We're going to start pulling out things like Newton's second law and so on to start describing what is causing the wind to blow the way it does. All right. That's this lecture here. Now, to kind of wrap it up, I just want to ask you a couple quick of these, these quick questions just to kind of give you a sense uh, of how well you understood what you just saw. Question one, the trade winds are persistent blank winds usually found in the blank. Westerly the tropics, easterly the tropics, northerly the polar regions, downslope mountainous regions. Which of these is the correct description of what trade winds are? All right, uh, make a choice from those four options and get a little feedback before you move on to question two.